Alright guys, this is way overdue, and I'm sure you can guess why. Sorry about that, but now that's hopefully sorted out, I can finally get to this. Oh, but before I forget, let me wish my viewers in the US happy holiday. There are some dinosaurs I don't have models of, either because they have never been made, or because those that exist don't have that tripod of sculpt, paint and accuracy I look for. As a result, I've never had a single Centrosaurus, one of the most well-known Ceratopsians. I'm glad to say that vacuum is now filled, and by PNSO no less. This is Jenny the Centrosaurus, and I like both the model and the name. Um, at the risk of TMI, my life journey seems crossed with girl names that start with J, as a history of exes and crushes will events. Jenny here measures 16 centimeters, or 6.3 inches, and for a 1 to 35 scale, represents an estimated length of 5.6 meters, or 18.3 feet. You can see she's quite small if we bring in the Machairoceratops. Ceratopsians have traditionally been divided into the Chasmosaurines and the Centrosaurines. There are exceptions, but in general, Chasmosaurines have larger, more elaborate neck frills with less formidable horns. Centrosaurines have larger horns with smaller but more elaborate neck frills. You'd expect the namesake of the group to exhibit these features, and indeed, it does. The name Centrosaurus means pointed lizard. It refers not to the nose or the brow horns as we might assume, but the marginal hornlets of the frill. It has very small brow horns and a large nasal horn. These are of course the commonly cited centrosaurine features. The brow horns are modest, um, looking almost like large scutes. The nasal horn in this model points forwards, which suggests we're looking at an older individual though not to the extent of Aeneosaurus. Now these forward projecting hooks, the P1s, are a distinguishing feature of Centrosaurus. That said, you'll see different permutations as well as sizes and orientations, and there's generally some leeway because there's no definitive correct combo. Fredrickson and Tumarkin de Ratzian in 2014 published a very interesting study in which they reconstructed ontogenetic changes in the craniofacial skeleton of Centrosaurus. The study design was quite clever, and I suggest you give it a read, but I'll just summarize some key findings. First, as the animal ages from youngest to most mature, the nasal horn goes from recurved to straight to procurved. Second, the supraorbital region is more variable than other areas of the skull. In the most mature animals, they can actually be resolved. And thirdly, as we get to the oldest individuals, the ornamentations are resolved, so they're shorter and more rugos. To an extent, we saw this in Horner's study on Triceratops epoxipitals too. I've modified these a little to get mirror images, so it's clearer to see, but note that even in mature individuals, the absence presence and extent of these ornamentations vary. For example, this specimen is in fact missing the P1, and the P2 and others are frequently asymmetrical. Taken together, we can say that Jenny here is a rather mature individual. But how much of these P1, P2, and other epiparietals and episcomosals should or shouldn't be there, we can't dictate. In short, I can sleep very well at night with this presentation. Now, I'm glad that PNSO has given the frill more visuals than the planar frill in their Triceratops, and there's a scientific basis for this. Farker et al. in 2009 compared skull pathologies in Triceratops versus Centrosaurus. There was no statistical difference between the number of pathologies in the jugal, nasal, and parietal bones. However, in the squamosal, the number of pathologies in Triceratops was significantly higher. The author suggests that while the Triceratops frill was more adapted to protection in intraspecific combat, that of Centrosaurus was more for display. Still, Centrosaurus may have butted flanks, if not heads, as rib fractures have been documented, as for Pachyrhinosaurus and Chasmosaurus. 
The choice that PNSO made regarding plain versus visual frills seems to acknowledge this difference. There's been a lot of back and forth about valid genera and species which I won't get into, but those of you around for longer may actually have seen Centrosaurus referred to as monoclonius in your dinosaur book as a kid, like this. And monoclonius is still regarded as separate by some. If you want to know more, I can recommend this book, if you can still find it. You know, I really wish there were more books like this that are updated with what we now know. It's still a great read since 1996. Unfortunately, the paint application differs from the release image, and you can see this very clearly. And it's very obvious. Now, first of all, it's a lot darker and muddier, so detail is lost. Now, let me say that the lights are actually brighter than I like, or you miss even more detail. There's a decrease in complexity of the skin in the nose, the texture and colour of the nasal horn, the supraorbital horns, especially the roots of these forward hooks, and the blending of the frill. And the purple-brown transition in the blue spot is lost, so they don't shine through as brilliantly as they could. And while we're on the paint, let's look at the body. My first impression is that the body looks too big for the head. Still, there have been other depictions, such as this one by Danielle Dufo from the Actiari et al. 2020 paper on osteosarcoma, look pretty similar. And from some angles, it does look very okay, so I leave it to you ceratopsian experts to comment below. The sculpting really is very high quality. If we compare this to my favourite Ceratopsian from PNSO so far, the Pachyrhinosaurus, you can see for yourself the difference. Uh, you can see the textures, the detail, the form of the musculature. And all these demonstrate the maturity of improvements that PNSO keeps pushing as its normal standard. However, what detracts from it is the muddy paint application, and that's a pity because you can see there's actually quite a bit of complexity going on, including this very subtle patterning, which I do like. All that, as well as the sculpted detail, would be clearer if a lighter colour was used. Indeed, in the release image, the yellow predominates, with the most delicate application of faint green, but here the green is comparatively blotchy and a lot heavier. Now here in the older Pachyrhino, despite less complexity, the colour mix makes it pop, while the Centrosaurus looks flat. Uh, in fact, the kind of aesthetic is more reminiscent of the old Spinops here. I remember that when the Pachyrhino came out, the colour of PNSO's actual models were looking so near the release image that I mentioned I might stop doing comparisons, but I find I'm doing them again. It also seems that as the sculpting has improved, the colour reproduction has taken a step back. So I wonder if PNSO is now working with a different factory. Now it's nice to see that even though this isn't a museum line model, there are still some extras. I'll just remark that this poster is beautiful, but so different from the model. I actually like the recurved nasal horn. And look at the blue around the eyes and the rostral area. I often feel that except for cases where poster depictions became outdated by some discovery, PNSO might well be served by following the initial design. Now let's do a comparison with some other Centrosaurians from PNSO. 
Now the Pecky Rhinosaurus you've already seen. The Cynoceratops. The Spinops. and the Machairoceratops, which is an example of an exception with longer brow horns. Of course, we should also bring out the Triceratops, which as far as I know is the only Chesmosaurian that PNSO has produced around this scale. I think we're way overdue for another. So that's it for the PNSO Centrosaurus. Once again, PNSO brings us another nice centrosaurine, and with more chasmosaurines, we can actually build out this group of dinosaurs like PNSO did with its pteropods. The sculpting is top notch, though the color palette needs to be improved and closer to the release images to match up with it. Still, I'm happy to finally have a centrosaurus, the namesake of one of the two major groups of ceratopsians. We just really need a Chasmosaurus, and we'd be well on our way to having a robust roster of these horned dinosaurs. I'll see you soon with another video.